Well, uh, we're going to get into the message, and it's going to be a little interactive today, too. I, I have three questions. Uh, one of them we'll just do all together, and you can shout out things from where you're at. And then the other two, I'll have you think about it and maybe share uh, briefly something that comes to your mind. So in a minute, I'm going to read from Ezekiel chapter 47. And please, if you have a Bible near you or you want to look on your phone, whatever works, I'd love for you to at least follow along with me while I read that vision, uh, verses 1 through 12. Uh, now, I have the title for the sermon, Go With the Flow. Now, you heard that, right? Expression. Uh, You've also heard probably swim against the flow, right? I would think. Um, Do you know who's really good at swimming against the flow? Fish. Good. Salmon for sure, right? They head up up river, right? Lay their eggs. All this kind of stuff happens. Like, wow, it's just amazing natural routine. Um, But there's a special word for that. So you're going to at least leave today. If you don't leave with anything, you'll leave with something like you'll learn a new word. Rio taxis. Do you know what that is? Rio taxis. It's R H E O T A X I S. Rio taxis. Seen in many fish, whereby they will turn to face into an upcoming current in a flowing stream. This behavior leads them to hold their position rather than be swept downstream by the current. Rio taxis is embodied by the phrase swimming against the stream or fight against the tide or whatever you want to say. Um, we understand it. If we take it from fish and, and apply it to ourselves, we say it's a way to go against or disagree with a prevailing or popularly held opinion or perspective. We, we use it like a, that kind of a phrase, right, as a turn of a phrase that means something more. Uh, to be countercultural can be a valuable engagement, certainly, right? It's, it's something, and, and, and as Christians, we sort of face different things like that. We just do. When Jesus says, follow me, right? And all that that means. But today, I'm not going to encourage you to swim against the stream. I'm going to encourage you to go with the flow. Okay? Go with the flow. Don't fight it. Don't resist it. Jump in. Okay? Are you ready for Ezekiel's vision? Here we go. I'm going to read from Ezekiel chapter. By the way, that's a picture from sabbatical a couple of years ago. Dion and I going down the Snake River in a double kayak looking at the Tetons. Watching the otters play. No kidding. Go with the flow. Here it is. Beginning at verse 1, chapter 47 of Ezekiel. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the temple faced east, east, right, where the sun rises. So as I continue to read, this is what I want you to do because the first question is going to come in a minute and we'll just share it all together. What do you notice about this stream trickle of water? What do you notice? Reading on, the water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. Now, I hope you that's about a little over four football fields. Maybe that helps some, maybe it doesn't. And then led me through water that was ankle deep. Measured off another thousand cubits, another four football fields, and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to my waist. He measured off another thousand, and by now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, Son of man, Do you see this? Okay. People of God, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river, and he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the 
Arabah, which is desert, where it enters the Dead Sea. Some of you have been there, okay? You're, you're listening to the flow of this water and you're thinking, there's something peculiar about this water. When it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. Wherever the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Englem. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. This is the word of the Lord. I, this summer, am following a lead of what was given to me about uh, speaking about passages that uh, have shaped you. This is one of them. This is one of them. I asked you what you notice about this river. Anyone, what do you notice? There's some peculiar things. It keeps growing. Now, it doesn't say that there's tributaries going into it. It's just a trickle that came from the temple, but yet as it goes and not too far, it's like it grows. What else? I hear something else. What, what, is this, what, what about this water? Relatively calm. There's kind of a peaceful s- setting with all of it. Okay, great. What, what I hear? Becomes fresh. How many of you have been to the Dead Sea? I have. I've floated in it. Dion and I were there. Peter's been there. Others? Literally, I mean, there's there's so... Everything just kind of drains in there, whatever it may be, and it just... Not much of anything lives there. This water, when it flows into the Dead Sea, it makes it fresh, and everything starts to live. What else did you notice? Anything. So many things in here that you can find. You guys got some good ones. It's mighty and powerful. Remember, like after like what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, after about sixteen football fields, you can't even cross it. The current is strong and it's deep. It's transformative. Everything it touches, what? Lives, grows. What do you notice that's along the banks? Trees are growing. And, and what's, what about these trees? It's so peculiar. Ever-bearing. Ever-bearing. And how often do they bear fruit? Every month. Now, do you know anything like that? Okay. It's amazing. What about this? The fruit that comes from the trees, that comes from the water is what provides food and healing. Because the water from the temple flows to it. Do you see this, people of God? Do you hear it? Second question. I'm going to give you a short time on this one. Where else in Scripture... Those of you who maybe been around the Bible longer, it's okay if you don't know the answers to these or you're not sure. But where else in Scripture do you hear this kind of language? There's your question. Think about it a minute. Ask Siri. No. <laughs> Think about this. This is this is amazing. This is not necessarily new language. It's language that will come back again in Scripture. That, uh, you know, students of Scripture, that'd be significant. Anyone want to take a guess rather than give you a whole lot more time on that? Anybody? Just what first impulse? Do you have one? Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Yeah, go ahead. And what are you referring to? I know Psalm 1. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes, if you're grounded by the stream of water, this tree, right, bears fruit. It says similar language too, like the leaves are always green and it produces fruit um, in season. Beautiful. Great place. Anyone else? Dion? Revelation 22. Um, can you give a couple phrases or thoughts out of there or what you see? I've got some of that written down because that's definitely one of the spots, the very end of the Bible. Yeah. The river of life flows from the temple, and it's throughout this vision of a city, and it gives life to everything. It, it waters the tree of life. That's there. If I can give, that's, a, that's exactly what I'm after. Then the angel showed me. This is another vision given to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. An angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, this is going to be important later, down the middle of the great street of that city, everything that it waters, it gives life, watering the tree of life, fruit every month, there it is again, and leaves for the healing of the nations. Boy, this river is something. Anybody have any place else? There's one I'm definitely going to mention. Yeah. This is great because, okay, what was said is that Jesus refers to himself as living water. Exactly right. Anyone who drinks of me will never thirst again. The one who drinks of me, streams of living water will flow. Great example. Another one that I'm thinking of is the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Let me just read a few phrases to you. Before the rains came, before any plant appeared on the earth... Streams come up from the ground, and the river waters the garden. What happens? Seeds, watered, burst to life. Trees and vegetation spring from the ground. God brings to life every living plant and vegetation for fruit, for food, and for healing. Genesis to Revelation Jesus' own words to Psalm 1, Ezekiel 47. So, beautiful picture, nice, uh, gracious metaphor, a river of life. I'm going to ask the question now. Turn the page in this message. So what? <laughs> so what? So one final question for today. Of what you know about God, whatever that knowledge may be, what you know about Scripture, as deep and wide or little as that may be. Whatever you know about the gospel of Jesus Christ, what could this river represent? Think about its qualities. Think about God. Think about Scripture. Think about the gospel. I'm going to give you a minute to think about this, okay? What could this river represent? Now, I'm launching now, okay? I'm sure there's theologians who supported the things I'm going to say next, right? And maybe some of the ideas you have about it. But use your imagination here of what you know. What could this river represent? I'll give you a minute. Ooh, you can't give an answer already. No, you can. Peter said the Holy Spirit. I say yes. Any others? The kingdom of God. Yeah, the language that Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom of God, it's like a small mustard seed, just a trickle of water. Right? The kingdom of God growing. Any others? Any ideas, any kind of concepts? Yeah. 
You can't live without water. It's kind of, this vision says, basically, it goes through the desert. There is no water. Not much is growing. But wherever that river goes, right, can't live without God. Do you remember Psalm 63 from a couple weeks ago? Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. But I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory. And because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will cling to you. Because you are my help, I will rest in the shadow of your wings. That sounds like Ezekiel 47 to me. Anyone else? The love of God. That's one I had in my mind. Absolutely, the love... Could that river be the love of God? We have the Holy Spirit. Well, who's left? Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus. Don't forget about Jesus. How could this be a picture or something? What could this river represent when you think about Jesus? Transformation, Transformation absolutely. New life, new creature. We always need healing, and Jesus can bring it. You want to know what I thought of? Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood. So this is how I'm going to go through this a minute. The Father's love, Jesus' blood, and a Holy Spirit flood. Maybe that helps you remember it, okay? So, let's see if I got this here. Whoops, a father's love. Let's start there. So God woke me up at 3 a.m. today. Why does he do this on Sunday mornings? Well, this is why. Listen to this. From the Psalms, his love endures forever. It never ends, never fails, saves us, surrounds us, He's patient in love. He's compassionate in love. He forgives in love. This is all from the Psalms. This river is the love of God flowing from the temple. Everywhere it touches, the, whatever it touches lives. John 3.16, God, Father's love, loved the world So much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Talk about transformation. Matthew 18, God our shepherd, when one wanders away, remember this parable he's telling? From the flock, he leaves the 99 to find the one who's wandered off. That's love. Matthew 7, God gives good gifts to those who ask him. Matthew 6, God knows what we need before we even ask Him. That's love. How great is the love of God? Well, it's like a mighty river. Here's 1 John 4, 9. God sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. Okay. Well, God's love leads us to the second one, which I thought about in my wondering, and that's Jesus' blood. So let's hear how that could be. Colossians 1.20. Through him, Jesus reconciles all things to himself by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Ephesians 1.7. In Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Hebrews 9. The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. How much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our hearts and consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Hebrews 10, brothers and sisters, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Romans 5, 
We've been justified by his blood, saved from God's wrath. His sacrifice is one of atonement. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? It's a mighty river. So deep and so broad that all your sins, all your failures, they are drowned in this cleansing blood and flood and river. Jesus paid it all once for all. When he held up the cup at the Last Supper, he said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Poured out for you. What is that river that begins as a trickle and then grows? All right, Holy Spirit flood. And then I'll start into the message for today. Oh, good. You caught that. Good. Holy Spirit flood. Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know what happened on Pentecost, right? It's like a flood. Romans 15, the Holy Spirit gives you hope, so abound in it. Another one from Acts, you will receive power to be my witnesses. That grows and grows and grows, the kingdom. Isaiah 11, you'll be given a spirit of wisdom, understanding, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Romans 8, the Holy Spirit will help you in your weakness. Romans 12, it'll transform your mind. Galatians 5, you'll produce fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faith. I, I probably doubled up. But hey, every month you get these. Self-control. John 14, it'll bring about obedience with the Holy Spirit's help. He's our advocate, our teacher, our comforter. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 says that in the love of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit such that it resides within us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. That water that flows from the temple comes right here. God's love poured out Jesus' blood, Holy Spirit flood, just as the vision of Ezekiel 47 reveals. Wow. So, you know, sometimes we'll read a text like that and think, man, that's irrelevant or it's outdated or maybe it's done and over with. Absolutely not. This river flows through all of humanity, through every tribe, language, tongue, nation, throughout all time until it culminates and Jesus being all in all. So, I think, I've got to catch up here. I want to finish with just going into prayer. Because sometimes when our imagination is sparked, it brings about things in us that the Holy Spirit wants to do or wants to move or wants to transform or change or, you know, it could be simply today that you're like so grateful for what God has done for you. With God's love and through Jesus' shed blood and the gift of the Holy Spirit, maybe you're feeling like, you know what, I have not been willing to step into that river I want to just control my life all on my own and make my own decisions and not surrender to anything except my own will.
you know, to go with the Holy Spirit's flow uh, actually requires like a heart posture of surrender and trust. I read to you last week, I, I think, yeah, yeah, the prayer of relinquishment. It, it's, for me right now, I'll share something. It's like I'm lamenting right now, uh, deeper and more than I thought I would at present about some things. And I think Jesus says, come to the waters. You don't have money. You don't have food. Come by and eat. Be washed. Be cleansed. Invite the Holy Spirit to come into your life and just like a flood. So I want to give you time to do that. We're going we're gonna to close with a final song today. We'll, we'll be able to do that. We'll kind of embody in the words of the song some of the things from the text today. But how often do we get a chance like this where we're together, we're all seeking God's face, and we're inviting the Holy Spirit to be here, and He's working, I believe it, where you know what? We can take a deep breath and go, Lord, would you have your way and will with me? It's a gracious invitation. So as you pray, I'm going to just share a few things along the way as I'm led by the Spirit, but make sure to thank God, ask God, praise God. God, you are the God that brings life out of nothing. You're the God who finds and saves what is lost. You're the author of resurrection and transformation. Lord, I pray today that as we've heard your word, as we respond in prayer and uh, any areas of surrender today, that you would just renew the desert places in us. You would make fresh the waters of the Dead Sea so that life abounds, that there can be joy, even in the midst of sorrow. There can be peace even in the midst of lament. That as was even spoken here today, that you can satisfy our thirst and bring about actually abundance, not just eternal life, but an abundant life. 